Good evening, and welcome to our discussion tonight from Ferris Baptist Fellowship. And tonight we're going to continue what we've been talking about, praying in Jesus' name. Tonight I want to focus our attention on the subject of asking God. And so we're going to use it our, as our text tonight, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do, not, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, I need to tell you, there's a whole lot in that passage, and we're not even going to remotely touch all that's in there tonight. But this passage reveals some following inappropriate actions and attitudes. The people that James is talking about there wanted a lot, and this was causing them to fight and quarrel among themselves. Presumably, they were frustrated with each other as they could not get what they wanted. Uh, the inability to get what they wanted had driven some of them to murder. Now, I don't think may necessarily we're talking about literal murder, but I think we can plug into what Jesus said that, you know, if you hate your brother, you've already got murder in your heart. That was his intention as he said that in Matthew 5, 22. And 1 John 3, 15 picks up on this same theme. So in any case, they were holding feelings, you know, ex having emotions that would be tantamount to murdering their brother. Now, I can't imagine that in a prayer meeting, can you? <laughs> but, but James knew some people that were doing that. They coveted but were unable to get what they wanted, so they continued to quarrel and fight. And they refused to pray, or if they did pray, they did so out of selfish motives. Now listen, the, the group of people to whom James <laughs> writes really actually looks a lot like some people today. There are Christians who are out to further their own agenda to get what they want by any means possible. When they are frustrated in their aims, they lash out at one another. But James says there's a better way than this. Instead of coveting, quarreling, fighting, or even killing, Christians need to simply ask God for what they want. One reason they do not have what they want is that they, is that they haven't asked. It's that simple. Uh, there's a debate, of course, in theological circles about whether God changes his mind or not, or if by prayer you can change God's mind or not. Uh, you know, there are some things that, you know, we're not going to get unless we ask for them, but if we ask, we will receive them. Now, I believe that God is sovereign, and so I don't think God ever, you know, changes his mind in the sense that we mean changes his mind. Uh, does God relent sometimes? But I think when you look at it, something we cannot really understand on any intellectual plane humanly is what the sovereignty of God entails. We talk about it as a subject and we say, well, it just means he controls everything. Well, that's pretty doggone simplistic when you think about it because there's a lot entailed in controlling everything. We say that God knows everything, but there's a lot involved in what that might mean. Uh, we, when we talk about God, we talk about all that can be known to us or about us. But when it says God knows everything, it means everything. Uh, and he all eternally knows it. So I don't think God ever changes his mind personally. But I think sometimes to us, it may appear that he does. Because if God changed his mind, God could be viewed as stingy when he didn't give us what we want. You know? And if he changes his mind, we could be seen as having power because, hey, I prayed, I changed God's mind. None of that can be possibly true. James' statement that you have not because you ask not doesn't guarantee that if we'll get everything we ask for. Uh, and I'll give you an example. <clears throat> a dad, a father might a tell his child not to steal anything from the tool shed, but just ask for it if you want something. But if the 10-year-old child goes out and grabs the chainsaw, the father is probably going to refuse. So sometimes when we ask God for something, <clears throat> he's going to refuse it because it's not going to be in our best interest. It could cause us harm. Uh, here's another one uh, in verse 3 of James 4. Uh, he talks about motives you, because sometimes it happens that we want to spend what we ask for on our pleasures. Now, somebody may think, doesn't God want me to have pleasure? Well, of course he does. 
But what you mean by pleasure and what God means by pleasure, I promise you, are two separate things. What you mean is you mean something that tantalizes the senses, that stirs up and rouses up emotions of a certain kind, maybe even good or bad, or something that actually just feels good. Well, I promise you that God sometimes brings us through things that ultimately bring us pleasure, but they don't seem like it at the time. We would never pray for those kind of things. You know, uh, we have this happen a lot in our lives. When we look back and we see what God did and how he protected this, that brings us pleasure. But at the time, that discipline didn't seem to be all that special, you know. Some requests that are still selfish at their root, you know, you know God's going to deny it because God's not into promoting selfishness. In fact, his big promotion from heaven is to squash the pride of mankind. And if he grants you all your pleasures, that isn't tackling your pride. So the best idea here is to let God decide what is best for you, but you still should ask, as we're going to talk about tonight. God may say no sometimes simply because we have wrong motives. And there may be sometimes that he says yes because he wants us to have what we ask for exactly the way we ask it. But that doesn't mean that necessarily his request and answer will be something that just arrives on a silver platter falling down from the sky. Sometimes they come carefully couched in other wrappers. Uh, receiving what we ask for may mean that God gives us the ability to save money, for example, to buy what we want. We may ask him for a new car. He may help us have a job where we can pay for that car after we save up the money. He's still going to answer that prayer unless, of course, our sinful desires get in the way. That, that little greedy component that wants it now. And you know, the world plays to that, doesn't it? We can have it all right now. In fact, I thought to myself, today is uh, May the 4th, 2022. The Fed raised the interest rates by a quarter of a percent today. I wonder how many people rushed right out and thought, you know, before that affects prices, I'm going to start buying some stuff up. That's that little greedy component I'm talking about, okay? Our prayer is actually a signal that we have abandoned trying to get things our own way, and we are instead deferring to God's judgment about what we get and how we get it. That is a very important idea. When we pray, what we're actually doing is we're abandoning getting things our way and saying to God, we're going to ask you your way. Now, what God wants to give us is infinitely more valuable and good for us than what we can dream up on our own. Therefore, we can pray with confidence and in faith, and by the way, with a clear conscience. Is there something you want? You need to ask God for it. Many times you have not because you simply do not ask. There's no guarantee from God that he's going to give you everything you want unless, you can put an asterisk by this thought, we ask it in Jesus' name, and then everything we ask for is guaranteed. But as we discussed last week, praying in Jesus' name comes with some real big baggage. It totally devoids any kind of pleasure on our own part or prejudice on our own part or passions on our own part that would interfere with the, the conduct and character of our God and King. Well, there's some promises I want to remind you of, speaking of asking and knowing full well that God hears. Listen to Mark 11, 22 to 25. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Now here, Jesus tacks in a, a little a condition. If you're going to come before God and you're going to ask God to do something for you, first of all, you can't doubt. you got to actually believe that God's going to do it for you. Now, do you ever, do you ever ask in faith like this? <laughs> you know, you're going to ask, but you know, you're not real sure he's going to do it, but you're going to peek and see. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about actually believing that it will be done for you. But then he throws another conditional idea in here, and that is that we have to pray from a forgiven and forgiving environment. 
In other words, it's sort of what Jesus said when he said, if you're on your way to put down your offering and you remember somebody's got something against you, you go make that right and then come and present your offering. God's real big on the idea that we can't come before him and start talking with him about holiness and purity and all that as long as we've got baggage left over with our brothers and sisters. So if there's a forgiveness issue, we need to take that up. So Jesus basically says, have faith in God. That's verse 22 of Matthew or of Mark 11. And also in Matthew 7, he tells us something very interesting. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Matthew 7, 7 to 8. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, it sounds like James is camping on something that Jesus says here in Matthew 7, when he says, you have not because you ask not. It actually in the Greek means keep on asking, keep on seeking, okay? Uh, the idea is a continual action. And it picks up the idea of Luke chapter 18 when Jesus said that men ought always to pray, to pray and not lose heart, okay? God is always trying to put us in the place of coming to him in some repetition. Why? Remember I mentioned to you that the killing of pride is God's top agenda for mankind? What better way to do that than to put us in the position where we are totally dependent upon him. And what better way to do that than to stretch out the answers to our prayers sometimes so that we have to make a decision if we're going to keep on with God or go our own way. See, when we go our own way, it means we still have a pride problem. But if we continue on with God, it reveals that we have a heart to, do, to go with God no matter what. And that's what turns God's head. That's faith in God, faith to believe him. Now, I want to give a Bible example tonight. Now, it turns out that I'm going to use Hannah on Sunday for Mother's Day. I'm not going to talk about the things tonight that we're going to talk about on Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, I want to talk about why Hannah was a godly mother and what some of the characteristics of Hannah were uh, as a godly woman and then a godly mother. Tonight, I want to look at her prayer, her prayer life. Because if you read the first two chapters of 1 Samuel, one of the things just reaches right off the page and grabs you is that Hannah is a prayer. She, she would come yearly to uh, the, the tabernacle, which was in Shiloh at this time. Remember, Hannah lived in the time of the judges, okay? So she'd come to Shiloh, and, and she and her husband and his other wife would worship the Lord there every single year. Now, Hannah's prayer eloquently celebrates the holiness and sovereignty of God and affirms the central tenets of Israel's faith. Not only is her prayer a testimony of God's handiwork in her own life, but it's also a foreshadowing of his actions in the lives of the prophet Samuel, King David, and the nation of Israel. Hannah, like several prominent women of the Bible, was barren and unable to conceive a child for a long time after marrying. In ancient Israel, children were considered a clear sign of God's blessing, you know, Psalm 127, you know, children are a blessing from the Lord and blessed is the man whose uh, quiver is full of them. They're like arrows from the Lord. Infertility brought severe disgrace to a woman because in those days, it meant she could not fulfill her God-given purpose of producing offspring for her family. Now, I'll give you an, another example of that. Remember Leah and Rachel, Jacob's wives? Leah was popping babies like crazy, and Rachel was, uh, you know, infertile, and that caused a real big uh, moment where Leah, <clears throat> and I'm updating the story to modern times, we go, nah, 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 nah. I've got kids and you don't, and that really grated on Rachel. <clears throat> now, Hannah was in the same spot because Penina, you know, the other wife of uh, Elkanah, uh, she had many children, and she mocked. Hannah. Now, uh, you can read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 1, 6, and 7. But notice, for years, Hannah poured out her soul's desire to the Lord in prayer. It says that in the text. For years, year after year, she would come to the tabernacle in Shiloh and put her request before the Lord that the Lord would open her womb. And then ultimately, she gets to the place where she promises the Lord that if she has a son, She'll give that child back to God and dedicate him for the Lord's service. Now, that's a pretty gutsy move on several levels, isn't it? I mean, really, that's, that's really like putting it out there. 
So one day at the tabernacle in Shiloh, the high priest Eli overheard Hannah's heartbroken petition and assured her that her prayer would be answered. Now, first of all, he called her a drunkard because he saw her lips moving and you know, she wasn't saying anything. And, and he castigates her for being a drunken woman and a ne'er-do-well. And so Hannah said, I, I wasn't drinking. I, I don't drink, you know. But uh, anyway, ultimately, Eli says that she's to go home, that God has heard her prayers. And so it turns out that she does have a child, Samuel. And true to form, when she weans that child, she brings that child to the tabernacle in Shiloh and drops him off with Eli. Now, frankly, people, there's so much wrong with that story. <laughs> Eli is a wicked high priest, and his two sons are just horrible. Ultimately, God takes the priesthood away from them, and they all die. Eli's a fat boy, and he's sitting on a stool, and when he heard the, the news about his... No, I mean, he was a fat boy. He fell off a stool and broke his neck. That's how he died, because he'd heard the news about his two sons being killed. So, that's, but that's getting ahead of the story. So, who wants to drop their kid off with that family? But... That's how much Hannah trusted the Lord, and she's going to honor her commitment. So if we look at this prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verses 1 and 2, Hannah's prayer begins on a very high note with personal expressions of pure joy and enthusiastic delight in the Lord and His salvation. She says, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted up. My mouth boasts over my enemies. For I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Now this is in celebration for giving her the son she asked for. Her barrenness had caused her humiliation and shame, but God had delivered her from all that. And notice how her rejoicing is in the Lord, not in Samuel. She's not rejoicing in the boy. She's rejoicing in the God who gave her the son. That's a very important point here. In other words, she praises the giver as more important than the gift. Note bene, when we're asking God for things, are we interested in the gift? Or are we more interested in the giver? That's a very important thing to analyze in your prayer life. When she says, my horn is lifted up, that's an expression that refers to the renewal of her strength. Hannah declares that her strength, her worth, her dignity, and her rightful place as a fruitful wife have been restored. She's been delivered from her shame, and she acknowledges God's greatness, his uniqueness, his steadfastness, and his holiness. In verses 3 through 5, Hannah's prayer takes on a more public dimension, allowing others to consider her words and join in. Hannah cautions those who boast and exalt themselves because God knows their thoughts and sees their actions. He judges in all matters, including military action, overindulgence, poverty, starvation, and infertility. There is nothing beyond God's control. So she says, Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are hungry are hungry no more. <clears throat> She who is barren has borne seven children, but he who has many sons pines away. Well, verse 6 through 10 contains some of the most poetic and linguistically beautiful portions of Hannah's prayer. Here we encounter a long list of actions which are contrasts. <clears throat> These are the things that the Lord takes up in dealing with human beings. And listen to the contrast. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the, da the ash heap. He sets them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundation of the earth of the Lord's, on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants. And that last little line we just read there reminds me that there's a promise in this. It's reiterated in Psalm uh, 37 verses 22 and 20, 23 when he says 22 and 23 when he says he will not allow your foot to slip okay uh, in Psalm 91 where he's talking about he will give his angels charge over you and the whole idea there is to make your feet steadfast and sure so in Psalm 37 22 and 23 and again in Psalm 91 uh, uh, 9 through 12 the whole idea here is that God can cause the feet of the righteous to stand. Now, if you read Psalm 1, you see that very same thing. 
you know, the contrast between the righteous and the wicked. All right. And there's a note also there in Psalm 32 that says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Well, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. That's, excuse me, that's Psalm 917. It, it is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So in all things, God is sovereign. Exaltation, social position, and even life and death are under God's control. God's actions are not random. As judge over the whole earth, God brings the worst actions against those who oppose him, while his faithful ones receive the blessings of protection, strength, and exaltation. Now, if you want to read Mary's song, you know, the Magnificat, as it's called, over in Luke chapter 1, 46 to 55, she echoes some of the, strength, the same ideas that Hannah is discussing here. The final sentence of Hannah's prayer is noteworthy for several reasons. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. When Hannah prayed this, Israel didn't have a king. She lived in the time of the judges, so her prayer is prophetic. Looking forward to a time when a king would rule the nation. Also, Hannah's reference to God's anointed is a clear messianic prophecy. The prediction that God would exalt the horn, that is to say, increase the strength of the anointed king, was fulfilled in part in the reigns of David and Solomon. But the ultimate anointed one, the Messiah, would be honored above all kings. It's a fabulous prayer. And it reminds me that uh, there, there ought to be some things that we learn from this. Uh, when we're thinking about Hannah, I want you to just see seven things that we can learn from Hannah's prayer. First of all, ask and be specific. Hannah came asking the Lord for a child. And by the way, she didn't ask necessarily for a boy. You know, she just said she'd give the child back in service. Now, clearly, it was probably the intent of her prayer to ask for a boy because, you know, people wanted boys in those days for some strange reason. I started off with three girls in our family, and I was just happy, proud as punch until number four came along, and it was a boy. <laughs> but, you know, in our world today, you just need to know we need to ask and be specific. Secondly, we need to examine our motives. I want you to see that year after year, as Hannah came, you know, was time there because of the time element to examine her motives and why she wanted a child. And if you really want to know what her motives were, she gave that child back to the Lord. I mean, come on. That's not a selfish request at all. She's not looking to have this boy so she can look over Penina and go, ah, 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 you know. She's looking at this as she wants to be blessed by God with a child so that she can bless God with the child. So examine our motives. Third, persist. Don't give up. I love that year after year idea. She just kept on asking God. She didn't give up. Fourth, I want you to see how she worshiped God. She worshiped God before that prayer was answered. She worshiped God after that prayer was answered. She worshiped God if she was weeding the child. Hannah's state was to be in worship of God. Number five, trust God to do what's best. Hannah didn't know what she was going to get. She just asked God for a child. You know, but trust God that he knows what he's doing, and when he answers, it'll be the best. Now, she doesn't wind up with the boy. Ladies, imagine what that would be like. And every year, the story goes on to tell us that when she'd visit, as the child was growing, she'd bring him a little robe. You know, and here's a child ministering before the Lord in a linen ephod. I mean, it's an amazing story. But she trusted God to do what was best. And then number six, stop looking around and keep your eye on the prize. Penina was on this like a fly on some really bad honey. I mean, always Penina is in her face about the fact that she can't have a child. She doesn't attack Penina. She just keeps asking the Lord, keep your eye on the prize. And then lastly, praise God when he answers. That's what this prayer ultimately is. It's, a, it's an amazing praise chorus to Almighty God in answering her prayer. So if you want to know something about praying in Jesus' name, following this prayer of Hannah can give you some clues. 
if you want to know how to avoid asking what the wrong motives or allowing things to come into your life which are going to affect your prayer life in negative ways, take a cue and a clue here from Hannah's prayer and see how she handled these things also. Well, there's a lot to think about, and I, I pray that you'll think about your prayer life. Now listen, I need to tell you something about prayer. There are a lot of things that people pray to and gods that people pray to today. And you need to know that the devil is real big on answering people's prayers. Because the devil would love to try to one-up God by giving you something that you really want, even if it's really, really bad. And so I want to caution you about how you pray. If you're going to talk to God, you got to come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The first prayer that God's going to hear on your behalf is when you put your trust in Jesus Christ and you learn how to come to God through Christ. He is our high priest. He is our advocate with the Father. And you can't come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And so you need to know that ultimately you can really only pray to God through Jesus Christ. Secondly, there are many things advertising themselves as gods. The Bible tells us that there's the true God, that's the God of the Bible. And then there are false gods, and they're all demons of Satan himself. Every God that vaults itself and presents itself in the world is a false God. It's not really a God. There's only one true God, and Jehovah is his name. But there are many things that seem to be, you know, like good ways to go, and they seem to, like, work out. So people pray to Buddha. Or they pray through Mary. Or they pray to other false gods and goddesses or whatever. Or some of them pray to the moon or even the earth. I mean, that's really dirty there. But anyway, you know, the idea is that you can't really be praying to God unless you come to the true God, the God of the Bible. You say, well, I prayed and my prayer got answered. I told you, Satan's real big on trying to answer your prayer. Remember, he is a supernatural being. He has miracle working power. His only restrictions are the ones that God gives him. But he is called the prince of the power of the air here, the God of this world here, for a reason. Now, don't ever get it into your thought that he's more powerful than God. Never, ever going to happen. But if you forsake the living God, you can be deceived and so twisted around that you'll pray to anything and maybe you think it might come true. Well... Disney says a dream is a, a wish your heart makes when you're fast asleep. I would stay away from that idea if you're thinking about prayer. Come to the living God through Jesus Christ and see how your prayers are answered through him. So if you have any questions about this, you can call us at 972-544-3564. Or you can drop, drop us a line at P.O. Box 203, Ferris, Texas, 75125. Or you can stop by the church, 809 East 8th Street, Ferris, Texas. Please, though, don't just let this drop. This is important because when we pray, as I mentioned, God uses our prayer life also to tackle sin and pride in our lives. So it's very important that we learn how to pray, especially in Jesus' name. Let's pray, and then we'll uh, end this program for tonight. Father, thank you for this time. Teach us, Father, how to pray. Help us, Lord, that when we pray, we will come to you through Christ by the power of your Spirit. And, Lord, we will pray in concert and harmony with who you are and how you've manifested yourself through your word. And help us, Father, to be free of error in this regard. Lord, teach us to be patient. Teach us to be accurate. Teach us, Father, to not give up. But especially, I pray, Father, you will teach us to pray in accordance with your will. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening.